Here's an excerpt from a new study. Correlation was observed between chronic EMF exposure and increased insulin resistance, oxidative stress, disruptions in hormonal balance, which can exacerbate hyperglycemia. So essentially, they were able to attribute EMF exposure, which we're all exposed to, we can't really run away from. They were able to link that with oxidative stress, increases in cortisol, which ultimately are affecting our hormones, they're affecting insulin signaling and all kinds of things, and able to link this all to metabolic dysfunction. So before we were saying we don't know if EMFs can have a negative impact on the mitochondria, on the metabolism or not, but now we're seeing that they could be a potential risk factor for insulin resistance. It's pretty wild. So we're going to get right into the specifics of it. And although you can't really protect yourself or block EMF completely, like if you understand how it's affecting each sort of system, you can do what you can from a nutritional standpoint, everything to like protect and possibly expedite the recovery from it. So the first thing that I want to talk about is these voltage gated channels that Dr. Martin Paul used to talk about. He was really pioneering some of the early EMF research. So he looked at like 23 different studies and ultimately was saying, hey, the reason that EMFs are causing a damage to our metabolism and causing a damage to our cells is because they are stimulating more calcium in a cell to ultimately make more of an electrical signal. So if you've ever been in like a city and you feel like you're buzzing, that's a very real thing because you're having additional sort of electrical stimulation in a way. It's like this excitatory effect. Calcium is excitatory. So when you have these what are called voltage gated calcium channels, when you have an influx of calcium, you have more of like a surge of almost electricity moving into your cell. Okay, so essentially what's happening then is you have like an overstimulated cell that then produces too much what's called nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide can long story short, become an oxidative stressor and cause oxidative stress and cause DNA damage. So it's like this whole downstream effect. And this has not been dismissed. Like this has been sort of reconfirmed as a plausible hypothesis, plausible theory for why EMFs are problematic. So it's not like crazy witch doctor tinfoil hat stuff here. So let's talk real quick how you can protect yourself from that particular one, right? The opposite of calcium is magnesium. We are very deficient in magnesium in today's modern diet and our food supply. So magnesium is going to block the action of calcium, making it so that excitatory effect of calcium is less. So you're not having as much of that sort of vibrational tone you might feel when you go to a big city, right? So that's one way we can sort of, in a way, electrically protect ourselves so you're not having so much calcium signaling. Because Magnesium will bind to what is called an NMDA receptor on a cell. And this is going to make it so that the cell stays, let's just say, a little bit calmer. And it can do this in the brain. It can do this at the muscle. That's why magnesium is so good for muscle cramps too. Okay, but now let's move into the next category, which is probably the really important one, mitochondrial. Okay, so let's look at a study that was looking at how EMFs affect the mitochondria specifically. This study was published in Frontiers of Public Health, and they found that EMFs affect what is called the mitochondrial proton motive force. This is essentially where electrons are moving through a proton gradient, an energy gradient, to produce what is called ATP, our energy. So it's not a series of like chemical reactions so much as it is like more of an electrical system, right? So we produce energy by taking electrons from our food, they go through our mitochondria, and they go through what's called a gradient. And as they do that, they essentially create a little explosion that creates energy. Sounds wild, but it's the way it works. When it is acted upon by EMF, it can disrupt that motive force. It can disrupt the electron passing down. What happens then is you have A, an inefficiency, so you're not producing as much energy, but B, electrons are escaping this process. And when electrons escape, they go around and they bounce around at things and they react with them. That is literally oxidative stress. It is when you have electrons that are reacting particularly with oxygen, and they were making this ROS, reactive oxygen species, or oxidative stress. DNA damage, aging, cellular death, apoptosis, all these things that are not good. Now, a little bit is fine, it's gonna happen, but we are seeing an increase when there's EMF exposure. Again, we can't run away from this stuff. So how do we combat that, right? Well, the big problem, in addition to the actual oxidative stress, is the fact that since the oxidative stress is occurring at that mitochondria site, it can damage the DNA of the mitochondria. Once the DNA of the mitochondria is damaged, what happens is then you're left with mitochondria that is replicating or reproducing, however you want to call it, in a way that is damaged because the actual DNA is damaged. So you've actually at a core level, messed up the mitochondria. 
So one of the ways that you can deal with this potentially is going to be by using something called urolithin A. Urolithin A is a compound that increases what is called mitophagy. So it allows the mitochondria to sort of consume and utilize its own wasted material. So when there's dysfunctional attributes of a mitochondria, it can recycle and use those. So if you've heard of autophagy before with fasting, where like it's cellular cleanup, this is more specific cellular cleanup at a mitochondrial level. The one that I use is one called Timeline. They are really the main one. They're the ones that have paved the way with a lot of the urolithin A research. There's multiple clinical studies done with Timeline and their urolithin A. So it's very legit stuff. They have it in a powder form, a gummy form, or a capsule form. And we're talking legit stuff studies like in JAMA and some of these other major peer-reviewed journals. So this is not fly-by-night random supplement stuff. This is something where urolithin A has been seen to be very potent at improving mitochondrial health. So the bottom line with this is it's not going to protect you from EMFs, okay? We can't really completely protect ourselves from that. That's not going to happen. It's just not in today's world. But it can potentially help correct some of the mitochondrial dysfunction that is occurring as a result, right? So What's happening is because your mitochondria is getting damaged, now your mitochondria is even worse at processing energy, which means it's now going to produce even more oxidative stress combined with, of course, environmental factors like EMF that increase oxidative stress. You do the math. So the best thing that we can do is take care of our mitochondria and take care of our metabolic health, right? So urolithin A is a good way to do that. So that link down below gets you 10% off of urolithin A if you do want to try that from timelines. So the top line is the description. And again, not bad for muscle building too, so it's pretty darn awesome for that. So there's another study published in Electromagnetic Biology and Medicine, and they had people use a cell phone or use a cell phone with a uh, like EMF blocking devices. Bottom line isn't about whether the EMF blocking devices worked or not. They actually did uh, to a certain degree, but they found that when exposed to EMF, a couple of things happened. For one, HRV, their heart rate variability, decreased. So people's resilience and recovery decreased, plain and simple. But they measured salivary cortisol, and they found that salivary cortisol increased. So it increased their stress. It increased their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis activation. It put them into fight or flight. It put them into this state where cortisol was elevated. We know that in a chronic state, chronic elevations of cortisol can lead to metabolic dysfunction, can lead to fat accumulation, visceral fat, you name it. So how do we combat that? Okay, so that particular arm, we combat with little things that can lower cortisol, right? Maybe a little bit of breath work, a little bit of stress reduction. There's also some simple things that we can do. Okay, we actually do in this case, we want to think about what are good healthy carbohydrate sources that we could use. Honey would be a good one here. Insulin can actually combat some of the effects of cortisol when used responsibly, but also the antioxidants that are in honey, the polyphenols that are in honey. These are hugely beneficial for metabolic health, believe it or not. So I would say maybe one teaspoon to three teaspoons of Manuka honey could be really beneficial just daily, just to get you those additional nutrients, but also just to get you maybe that little bit of carbohydrate load that you need that might help out with the cortisol spike. The bottom line is though, from a uh, side of cortisol, the best thing you're gonna be able to do is just bring your stress levels down. Let's talk a couple other things in terms of the oxidative stress directly though. So the oxidative stress piece can be combated in a couple different ways. We're not gonna stop the bombardment of EMF, but we can slow down some of the downstream stress. So Moringa is another really powerful compound I recommend. Moringa is unique because it has something in it that's called MIC1, so isothiocyanates. This is interesting. It seems to increase, so it doesn't just seem to, it does increase what is called called NRF2 activation in our body. So NRF2 is sort of our body's sort of internal antioxidant system. It revs up over 200 different detoxification pathways in the body, predominantly like glutathione peroxidase and superoxide dismutase. So the more that we can turn up our body's internal systems, the better, right? You don't want to just be dependent on external antioxidants. You want to build it yourself. So Moringa is a really good one. But then a couple of other routes you can go. Sulfurophane, so broccoli and uh, allicin from garlic. So with broccoli, believe it or not, if you eat it with mustard, it activates compounds in it that has epigenetic properties and abilities to increase anti-inflammatory systems and antioxidant systems in the body. 
We all hear about taking things like vitamin C or things like that as antioxidants. I am telling you, although those things work, the best thing you can do is take things or eat things that increase your body's internal antioxidant systems. So broccoli, and then with allicin from garlic, you want to actually cut up the garlic and let it sit for like 10 minutes. It activates a compound in it that then activates more of this NRF2 effect in your body. This is hugely important. So by incorporating broccoli, by incorporating garlic, by incorporating moringa into your diet, you put yourself at a better chance of being able to protect yourself from these negative effects of EMF. You're not blocking or detoxing the EMF directly, but you're directly hitting the nail on the head with where we see the effects coming from. And then of course, the mitochondrial effect. You're definitely wanting to focus on something like urolithin A. That is how you kickstart sort of a healthier recycling of your mitochondria. And then the magnesium from sort of the electrical side to be able to combat sort of that overstimulation from those voltage-gated calcium channels that are just getting knocked on and stimulated with lots of EMF. So just because there's going to be naysayers here, because we're talking about EMF, I also want to make sure that I mention out of a 2023 Frontiers in Neuroscience study, here's what they said. ELF, EMF, of different frequencies and intensities will have various effects on biological activities. The research on the health effects of ELF and EMF cannot come to a consistent conclusion. What that means is that we know they do something. We can't 100% positively say these things are damaging us or harming us. Why? Because that is a bold statement for a big clinical paper or the world to make. But we know when you look at this stuff, it's affecting tissues, it's affecting things. And we're not all able to move out to the mountains. Please don't, because that's where I'm going. Bottom line is that we have to be able to do what we can from our own systems and processes to deal with what's around us. As always, keep it locked in my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.